Merci, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Brown. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very pleased to be here. Once again, I'm back in Canada, the country of birth of my father, of course. But it's for another reason, actually, that I'm particularly pleased to be here this afternoon with you. And it's because of the uh, pleasure of uh, being here for discussions sponsored by the Broadband Institute and to uh, listen to the what people who are engaged uh, have to say, what they have to say about real issues, the issues of our era, problems such as uh, growth, uh, inequalities, jobs, uh, resources, and climate change. And I want to commend you for your work, for your role, and for all you've been doing these past few days. From which I come, we're just a bit behind. Uh, we have one party with a candidate firmly rooted in the Gilded Age of the 1890s. That would be my senator, Ted Cruz, uh, uh, who favors the gold standard uh, and the abolition of the trade union movement. By the way, and I just to refer to what Larry Brown just said, uh, you should be immediately on guard whenever anyone says that something is the gold standard of X. The gold standard was one of the least successful monetary regimes in the history of capitalism. It was abandoned at the domestic level in the United States in 1913 and at the international level in 1933. I, just because it glistens, does, and even if, because it's, if it's gold, does not mean that it's a good idea. Anyway, we have one such candidate, and we have another candidate in the same party uh, who uh, is, comes to us straight from the, uh, uh, the clannish, that's with a K, 1920s. <laughs> and if you fast forward in 70 years and switch to parties, you'll find a third uh, who is you know, admittedly two generations ahead, but still stuck in the 1990s in a period of evident but unstable prosperity based on a credit boom which came to an end and which cannot be repeated. So we are, we consider ourselves fortunate. Uh, in fact, something of a breakthrough for us that we do have one candidate, that would be my man, Bernie Sanders, who is actually rooted in the 21st century, has made a connection to it, has some understanding of it, and who talks about the issues that I just mentioned on a regular basis. Growth, jobs, unemployment, inequality, resources, climate change. Our corporate media and our political establishment is in shock over this development. Even Paul Krugman, with whom I've been historically allied, and who was once in the modern camp, uh, now writes that while Sanders has been useful and constructive, he should avoid making arguments that are so persuasive uh, that he might actually win the nomination. <laughs> it's safe to say that Bernie Sanders, who's been in American politics for 40 years, uh, knows when to take and when to disregard um, outside advice. <laughs> Behind the new politics of our situation is a new economic condition, an age, frankly, of reduced growth, truly a post-Keynesian 
age in a strict sense, an age when the simple remedies of the 50s and 60s are no longer sufficient, that is to say stimulus programs on the one hand and printing money on the other. Instead, we face geophysical constraints and institutional failures. And we need to accept the former, to deal with them as they are, because that which cannot be changed must be dealt with, and to address the latter, that is to say, to fix what can be fixed. And the issue is how to go about incorporating those two um, aspects of a necessary agenda into the thinking of an economics profession uh, and a political uh, class uh, which is entirely resistant uh, to anything smacks of novelty or complexity. The geophysical limit of course, is, of course, climate change. The problem we should have faced 40 years ago and for which, failing to do so, we our generation, my generation, will not be forgiven. Now, it must be a high priority, an overriding priority in many respects. And we must do what we can, recognizing that we are very far behind uh, in terms of uh, what we, where we need to be in order to prevent uh, catastrophes beyond imagining for a generation or two from now. I'll just make that point, uh, lay it out there, uh, and hope that our attention is riven on this subject uh, from this point forward in the most serious way. I am, however, an economist, so I'm going to speak primarily on topics uh, that are closer to my own capacities. These are the institutional challenges. What are they? Uh, one of them certainly has to do with resources and it includes the financialized and highly unstable markets for energy uh, that we now uh, endure and which work sometimes to choke off economic growth by driving up the price of resources in a speculative fashion. That's what happened in the run-up to the great crash in 2008. And sometimes to thwart uh, the progress of conservation and investment, uh, profitable investment in renewable and sustainable energy sources, which is what's happening now as the prices are brought down on the downswing of a speculative cycle. These challenges and failures include the palpable decline in our physical security at the global scale, fed by catastrophic armed interventions, which in turn field a demand for more armaments and a climate of fear and insecurity, which erodes both our freedoms and our, our space for constructive political debate. A particular example, perhaps an extreme case, was yesterday's prattle about nuclear terror in Washington at that summit which came, I have to say, to my regret, from our president who has committed a trillion dollars to the modernization of nuclear weapons that should long ago have been abolished. An issue that we should not forget threatens us all and will continue to do so until we finally mobilize the political forces to bring it under control. On a somewhat more domestic and perhaps benign, but nonetheless dramatic plane, we have to deal with the fact that we're in a technological revolution, one that should be enriching our lives and to some degree actually is, but that is also in an unrestrained and savage way uh, leeching jobs from our economy 
and enabling new forms of workplace discipline and general surveillance. Something which is inherent in the technical capacity that needs to be controlled by societies that remain utterly and militantly committed to personal freedom and to a workplace that is free of intimidation uh, and, uh, and oppression. Fourth, there is the financial sector. We have the gold standard of financial sectors. <laughs> It is straight out of the 1890s. As predatory and dysfunctional now as it was back then, serving no identifiable public purpose now for quite a number of years, and in addition to that, effectively immune to the rule of law, to prosecution for crimes that range from the mundane but rather massive financial frauds that motivated the subprime crisis and the, uh, uh, and the sale of corrupt mortgage-backed securities to uh, over-eager but rather gullible European investors, uh, to such, uh, let's say, transparent uh, infringements as uh, the massive money laundering of drug cartel money. This is a state of affairs that has to be brought to an end because so long as one has a financial sector that is outside of legal control, no one should be expected to place the least confidence in it as a manager of resources, and no one will until this problem is dealt with. The underlying issues of motivating the functioning of a private economy, which is important for all kinds of small business operations and medium-sized businesses, for households seeking mortgages and everything else, cannot return uh, to the uh, functioning that was, uh, that was common in the immediate post-war period when the financial sector was effectively regulated. The rise of inequality, basic fact that we all are aware of, is from my point of view as a applied statistician, which is what I do in my day job, a most useful window onto this world. The phenomena that I've just described in finance, in technology, in military uh, uh, expeditions, and in resources, resource markets, show up very plainly in a detailed analysis of the distribution of incomes. It is, in other words, what I study is a statistical mirror of financial predation, a Schumpeterian revolution and oppression, war profits and resource rents. And our political system, here I speak of the United States because I would not presume to comment on anything going on in my beloved neighbor country to the north, our political system reflects the maxim, the shortest and best sentence in the entire Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, published in 1776, when he wrote, Wealth is power, as Mr. Hobbes says. What is to be done? Stodielet, as Lenin would have put it. The key insight, the organizing principle, is that in difficult times, we need more, not less, social cohesion. The remedy is not rampant and unrestrained growth for a short period of time, collapsing afterwards as it would inevitably do, but solidarity. It is not only efficient production, but sustainable patterns of consumption and living rooted in the successful pr provision of common goods, of public goods, of a deeper and more cohesive common wealth uh, in health and safety and education and culture in the environment and in the long-term economic security which permits each of us to live a decent life in the present free of 
untoward and unnecessary fears about the future, all of which require progressive taxation, stabilization and regulation of the financial markets, firm and strict limits on pecuniary corruption in the political process, social control over the processes and people who tend to wish to dominate us and to cause us to live in instability and trepidation. Hence, we come back to the Sanders program. Universal health insurance, debt-free, tuition-free, public university education, a $15 minimum wage, combined with breaking up the big banks so that they become manageable and regulatable and subject to public uh, purpose, and the restoration of progressive taxation on the highest incomes and the biggest estates. It's not a complicated program. It's a straightforward mix of proposals. It's not everything that would be required, but it's a very decent start. And what Bernie Sanders has done in the United States, incidentally, was not to propose these things in some original sense, and it was not certainly his rather, um, let's say, unusual personal persona that is carrying the cause. What Bernie Sanders has done is to uncover that in the last decade or so, and particularly since the debacle of 2007 to 2009, the Great Recession and all of that, a generation has grown up in America for which these particular proposals represent the essence of what they know they need, represent the essence of their own view of their problems and how best to handle them. And this has coalesced now into a political movement, something which I think is probably as much of a surprise to Senator Sanders as it is to the world of outside observers, but for which he, as a figure of uh, considerable political discipline and uh, great imagination, for the discovery of which he deserves an enormous amount of credit. And so a set of ideas have, to my surprise as a cynical observer of uh, stillborn political movements for almost 50 years, a set of ideas has captured the imagination of the young, whose interests are directly engaged, so it's the rational imagination of the young. And it suggests that for all of our sins and all of our troubles, there may be some hope and that we're not quite finished yet. Thanks very much indeed. I thought I was going to have to say it was a difficult act to follow earlier, but I think uh, we followed it. Thank you, Professor Galbraith, for getting us going here and setting the tone for what I'm sure will be a great discussion. Uh, my name is Peter Blyer, and as of about a month ago, I am the executive director of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. And thanks. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today to play a small role in getting these folks going uh, and to moderate this Progress Summit panel. And again, congratulations to the organizers of this incredible event. So now that we've heard from The Economist, and of course not just any economist, um, <laughs> it's time to hear from some politicians, although clearly an economist who's politically engaged, which isn't always the case. but. So now we're going to hear from two senior progressive politicians who face the challenges that Professor Galbraith has laid out in two very different jurisdictions. And they'll lay that out for us here today. First of all, Chi Anwura. 
is a Member of Parliament for Newcastle Central and the Shadow Minister for Culture of the, and the Digital Economy. Welcome, Chi. Yeah. Thank you. You've got a fan club already. <laughs> right on. Newcastle. <laughs> You've been hard at work. Uh, so uh, Chi uh, was previously the Labour Party's Shadow Minister for Innovation, Science and Digital Infrastructure. And prior to her election to Parliament in 2010, she served as the head of telecoms technology at Ofcom, the UK's uh, regulator, uh, communications regulator. And I, of course, I should add that she is a chartered electrical engineer. <laughs> wow. Remember that. Thank you. Right next to me, John Horgan. John Horgan is the leader of the BC NDP. So after a career in government in the private sector, John was elected to Ledge in uh, 2005. He represents the riding of Juan de Fuca in Vancouver Island. I shouldn't be telling John that, I think he knows. <laughs> Before his election as leader in 2014, he held a series of important critic uh, portfolios, education, mines and energy, and he was the opposition house leader. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Great. So, just, a really quick word on how we're going to proceed before getting to John and Chi. Each of our panelists are going to have a few words for us uh, in response to Professor Galbraith. And that will be followed by exchange between and amongst them. And then we'll go to your questions from the floor. And in case you're wondering, just advance notice, this is a low-tech session, so we'll be using the uh, 20th century mics as opposed to your <laughs> smartphones. Don't reach for them, okay? I think it's because they don't have confidence in my ability to handle the iPad, maybe, so <laughs> hold the applause on that. Okay, so uh, without, <laughs> without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to John to give us the view from BC. Thank, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for the very warm welcome. It is. Uh, Truly an honor to be on a stage with such an esteemed economist. We were talking in the, in the green room off stage earlier on, how shall we introduce each other? And uh, the, the professor said, just call me James. But esteem, esteemed James doesn't seem to have the same <laughs> the gravitas as the esteemed professor. So it's a tru truly an honor to be here with Professor Galbraith and with Chi as well. Uh, we were, uh, again, speaking offline, and, and my passion for cricket uh, is not shared by her, but it's whenever I get an opportunity to talk to someone from the old country, the mother of parliaments, I bring up cricket. Uh, as leader of the BC NDP, I've been asked to uh, join the panel today and give the people here a largely central Canadian audience, I have to say, a perspective from the West Coast. And, and this is an appropriate place and it's an appropriate uh, subject matter for me to be speaking with you because there is a mythology about British Columbia, I think, in the rest of Canada. Quite often we're looked upon as, as the hewers of wood, the drawers of water, a re predominantly resource-based economy that is, uh, over the past number of years, has had a higher growth rate than other jurisdictions in Canada. And that, that is true. The numbers are correct. But uh, as uh, James has, has highlighted, uh, uh, we're not in normal anymore. And, and the notion that somehow our resources are driving our economy just isn't the case in British Columbia. For example, resource industries, mining, forestry, oil and gas in British Columbia make up just 2% of the direct jobs in British Columbia. I'm fairly confident that that statistic, that statistic is a surprise to many of you in this room because the mythology of British Columbia is our mighty forests, although I have to say these modestly sized <laughs> Ontario trees here <laughs> remind me of home. Um, but there's this perception, uh, and, and uh, of course Monty Python has us uh, well in mind with our I'm a lumberjack and I don't care, but we have, we have 35,000 fewer lumberjacks in British Columbia since 2001 when the BC Liberals, our gold standard, for regressive politicians <laughs> in Canada came to power. Imagine that, 35,000 fewer people working in the woods in British Columbia. You're probably not aware of that. That's the fact. And if you think that only 2% of the direct jobs are coming from mines, oil and gas, and forestry, then where are the revenues coming in British Columbia? Well, first and foremost, we are also the last jurisdiction in Canada with a regressive flat tax our, we call it our medical services premium. And this past budget, the medical services premium, which has been going up 4% a year every year since the Liberals doubled it in 2008, 
now brings in $2.6 billion in revenue to the Treasury, which is more than the revenue from forestry, natural gas, and mining combined. Other sources of income for the province of British Columbia. Uh, liquor sales have doubled since the Liberals came to power. Gambling revenues have gone to <laughs> $1.2 billion. And the property transfer tax is booming, as is the distorted real estate market in Vancouver. So think about that for a minute. Rather than focusing on a new economy, the high-tech economy that Chi is going to be talking about, green jobs, Christy Clark is driving our economy with blackjack, booze, and bungalows. And that is not a sustainable, it's not a sustainable way to, to build a province. And one of the other issues I wanted to focus upon is because quite often when we think about inequality, we don't think about the face of inequality. I'm the, Chi and I are the retail politicians on the panel today, and it's our job, and it will be my job 13 months from now, to convince mm -hmm. the people of British Columbia before they go to the polls that enough surely should be enough from governments that are not investing in people, that are not investing in infrastructure, and they're not investing in, in this, the services that the public increasingly is demanding. The face of poverty, the face of inequality in British Columbia is the working poor. We have the lowest minimum wage in the country, the highest, the highest cost of living and the lowest minimum wage. That's our gold standard of regressive politics in British <laughs> Columbia. The working poor are below the poverty line and they're making, if they are lucky, a little bit more than the $10.45 that is mandated by the provincial government by law. People with good jobs are also the face of the working poor. They're the face of inequality. They spend hours commuting from their homes that are great distances away from where they live because they can't afford housing in the lower mainland. There are examples, you may have seen them on the evening news or in the, the national press, uh, stories of people purchasing homes, offshore speculators purchasing homes for four and five million dollars and then tearing them down to build a new home and then <laughs> leaving it vacant. That's the face of inequality in British Columbia. Children. British Columbia has the distinction of leading the country in child poverty for 10 consecutive years. That's the face of poverty. That's the face of inequality. And people, the most vulnerable, people with disabilities and those on income assistance have not had a rate increase in a decade. Nothing over the past 10 years. I'm fairly confident even in slow growth or an era of, of, of slow growth that the costs for those individuals have been escalating year over year. This year, the Liberals did everyone a favor that has a disability. They increased the rates for those with disabilities, not those on income assistance, but those with disabilities. And at the same time, they clawed back three quarters of it by increasing the costs of basic transportation bus passes. What kind of people do that? Well, the gold standard of uh, progressive politicians do that. And, and so we've got the working poor, we've got people that have good jobs that are, that are stuck in their cars, not being able to access transit because of a regressive uh, uh, plebiscite that the BC Liberals foisted upon the cities in the, in the region. Uh, it was turned down, of course, and so we've had three years of no growth in transit. We've had more congestion, we've had uh, more impact on, on our greenhouse gas emissions. And these choices are choices that this government has deliberately made. They have balanced the budget. They will pat themselves on the back end. And what choices did they make when they balanced their budgets? They sold the silverware. They, they sold our assets for short-term gains. They increased fees for those who were most vulnerable. And they gave, believe it or not, and I oftentimes look at people and they shake their heads in disbelief, but in a time when they were retrenching, in a time when they were reducing services, in a time when they were asking regular people to pay more for hydro, for medical services, for public auto insurance, they gave a $250 million annual tax break to the top 2% of wage earners. Only in <laughs> British Columbia could you do that. Only Nixon could go to China, and only the regressive politicians in British Columbia <laughs> could, in the face of abject poverty, as you can see in some portions of British Columbia, give a quarter of a billion dollar tax break annually to the richest people in the province. Shame indeed. Shame indeed. I'm good. I, I got a shame. How far in am I on that? As, an, as, a, as a retail politician, I usually get seven minutes in, this uh, says. So uh, it took me seven minutes to get a shame. Uh, Ed Broadbent, Ed Broadbent uh, yesterday on this stage said that uh, it was the Paul Martin budget of, of 1995 that started the withdrawal of federal services in British Columbia, and he's absolutely correct. 
we often think of the dark decade that we've just come out of with the Harperites, but in fact, it was the early uh, iteration of the Federal Liberal Party that started the pullback on housing, the pullback on health care uh, to the provinces. And as a subnational uh, government, the leader of a, a party that wants to run a subnational government, we need partners in Ottawa to get back into the game when it comes to housing. We need partners in Ottawa that want to get back in the game of providing health care in British Columbia and in every corner of the province. The last. The last example I want to I raise is, is over the past 15 years, as we've seen uh, levels of inequality rise, we've seen an assault on organized workers, trade unionists, mm -hmm. and nothing more graphic than in the health and education sector in British Columbia. When the BC Liberals came to power a decade and a half ago, they, they stripped contracts. They, the largest firing of women in the healthcare sector in the history of Canada, where thousands and thousands of women lost their jobs, hospital employees, union workers, uh, or they had to take a 15% pay cut while tax breaks were given to corporations. Uh, and in the, in the education sector, contracts that were stripped that are still 15 years later being fought courageously, courageously by the BC Teachers Federation here in the Supreme Court of Canada. And, and this, is the, this is the gold standard in, in Canada and in British Columbia of regressive politics. So my proposition uh, to you and my proposition to the people of BC uh, to address one way we can address the inequality crisis that is emerging in British Columbia, the affordability crisis, is to focus on public education, all facets of public education. I be firmly believe that the great equalizer in our community is giving everyone equal access to education and opportunity. And it starts, uh, I believe, uh, throughout the spectrum, early childhood education, K-12, and post-secondary education. With respect to post-secondary education, your economic circumstance should not be a barrier. Your abilities should be able to be uh, completely realized in a, in a country as vibrant and dynamic as Canada and in a province with such great potential as British Columbia. Anyone who wants and can uh, access post-secondary education should be able to do that, and that's a commitment that I'll be making in the months ahead. The, uh, the K-12 sector, as I said, uh, has been starved for the past 15 years, uh, underfunded, downloading. Uh, and, and for me, if we're not going to invest in our K-12 system in a massive way in the coming years, our children will not be prepared to be the employees, the innovators, and the leaders that we're going to need as we go into the new era that James talks about so ably. We need to make sure that class size and class composition is a fundamental priority for the people that are running our province, and I intend to do that. And lastly, <laughs> lastly, I am inspired by the work of of advocates that are here with the Progress Institute, uh, Progress uh, Summit and, and others across Canada, but most specifically in British Columbia, the need to uh, invest in adequate, affordable, public, universal childcare, and that's what we're going to do in British Columbia. I move, I move by the... Uh, by the work of the, the, uh, the advocates in British Columbia, the $10 a day movement, and it is the commitment that I'm going to be making in the, today and throughout the, uh, the next number of months that if we're not prepared to invest in our children to make sure that child care and early education is there, K-12 education is there, and opportunity to seek the skills we'll need to compete in the modern economy, then British Columbia will continue to lead the country in child poverty will continue to lead the country with the gross inequities that I've just articulated for you today in the time that was available to me. Uh, it's, it is my commitment to, to the progressives in this room and the progressives across Canada that British Columbia can be the beacon that it has been in the past. It's my intention to make sure that happens 13 months from now. So thank you very much for having me. Brilliant. <laughs> Over to you, Chief. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me over here from, uh, from the UK. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I was told by a leading Canadian businessman who shall remain nameless that this was um, not, not the gold standard of progressive politics, but the Davos of progressive uh, politics. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but let me tell you, from what I've just seen these few days, there is a lot more productive value creation being generated and distributed here than I've seen at Davos. Not that I've ever been, but when I've seen on television, you know. 
So it's great to be here, and it's also a real privilege to, you know, to, to share a, a, a stage with, uh, with James Galbraith. Um, as a progressive uh, politician, indeed as a human being, one of the real frustrations coming after the global financial crisis was that it should have, it should have discredited neoliberalism, it should have discredited the casino capitalism of the banking sector, it should have discredited the corporate, the, the, the agency model of corporate governance, and it should have discredited the, um, the credit rating agencies. And yet instead it seemed to be us, the progressive left, that was left without a credible economic narrative with the exception of a few, I won't say voices in the wilderness, but leading progressive economists such as James that could give us hope that we would be able to put together a progressive economic narrative about the equality economic vision for our countries and for our jurisdictions. And it's also great to uh, be sitting next to the man who I fully expect in 13 months will be leading British Columbia. Thank you. Uh, leading them away from, what was it, blackjack and booze, uh, and, booze and bungalows and to <laughs> a more equitable future. And I would also say that it sounds like the British Columbian government has been cut from a very similar cloth to our British conservative government, uh, which in the last, you know, the last few weeks had managed to deliver a budget which cut welfare for disabled people in order to pay tax cuts uh, for the richest and for corporations. Uh, that, was, that was their, if you like, their, their, their economic vision for our country. And um, I'm so, so great to hear that you will have a chance to and see your government, unfortunately, a long time before we have a chance to exceed ours. Now, 13 months ago, 12 months ago, in fact, the UK Labour Party was, um, as part of it, I was, we were uh, campaigning and preparing for government. And we were, our economic platform was one that you may be familiar with. Um, austerity light, you know, a kinder, more considerate, you know, longer austerity. Well, we lost. Um, and um, I argued um, at the time that we needed, we needed to take austerity economics head on, you know, and the accompanying continuous marginalization and reduction of the state and the public sector, which necessarily goes along with it. So since then, we have had a leadership change and uh, Jeremy Corbyn is our leader. Um, <laughs> some people argue that he is the, the Bernie Sanders of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm not gonna comment on that, <laughs> James. Uh, but uh, we, ha what we've, we have put in place uh, a new e an economic council of advisors who are helping us to develop an economic narrative which is focused on decentralization, democracy, fiscal credibility, and has as its heart the recognition that growth must be sustainable, inclusive, and equitable. Now, yeah, as an engineer uh, uh, from the north of England, uh, Newcastle, and just as an aside, my sport is football. <laughs> Soccer here. Uh, and Newcastle United aren't doing so well, so I'm going to focus on economics. <laughs> um, uh, I grew up in the north of England, you know, the industrial north, the heart of the, uh, of the first industrial revolution. And I often, you know, think about that uh, revolution. I actually live 250 yards from where Stevenson built his first rocket uh, uh, engine. And um, you know, that industrial revolution drove huge economic growth. 
But it took the risk taken of social activists, mainly in the labor movement, and the rise of progressive politics and before some of that growth got shared. You know, taking nine-year-olds out of cotton mills and putting them in school, for example. And we're now in the midst of a new industrial revolution. I mean, I've said that so many times, and so many people have said that, you know, I think it's one of those cliches which is, which is true. We are in the midst of a new industrial revolution, but we don't want to wait a an, hundred years before the rewards of that get distributed. Yeah, and, and <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, the economist Mariana Mazzucato, who I know was a, one, one of your keynote speakers here a couple of years ago, yes, and has a, fat, has a great fan base. And one of the things that she says is that you know, the entrepreneurial state uh, can drive innovation based and equitable growth if we have more confidence in it, if we have more confidence in the unique power of the state and the public sector to change and deliver, rather than forever trying to ape a private sector, which often doesn't change and deliver. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very pleased, so pleased that James also emphasizes the social nature of capital, because uh, I believe that that reflects a key um, challenge for progressives. And this is what I'll just uh, focus on before we have a couple of minutes. So um, the future economy, and as progressives, we, we, shouldn't, we haven't got to be just relevant to today. We've got to be relevant to the future. In fact, I think we've got to own the future. The future has to be our vision. And the future economy, it's often called the sharing economy. I prefer to call it the new intermediaries economy. I know it's not as snappy. It's not as sort of uh, touchy-feely, but it's more accurate. When you get into an Uber cab, and I see that Uber are going to be um, just going to be um, allowed in, in Ottawa. When you get into an Uber cab, the cab driver isn't sharing her car with you. She is renting space in that. And it is Uber who is the intermediary and in turning a book on that. Just as Facebook is the intermediary in you selling your data to advertisers in return for you know, a few more likes. Yeah? And back in the 90s, we often talked about how digital would uh, disintermediarize, take out the middle men and women from business models. And it did, but it created a whole new set of intermediaries. Uh, and they are the ones who are making profit out of your assets. And what they have in common is that they are network platforms. Now, and this is what I thought I'd like to leave you with, networks can concentrate power but they can also distribute power, metaphorically and literally. And the question, I think, for us as, as progressives is, are, is this an opportunity to flatten and distribute power as we distribute the rewards of this new industrial revolution? Or is it going to be a time when we concentrate power into the hands and the pockets of these new, of these new intermediaries? And how do we uncover the capital power relationships which are effectively hidden behind this lovely term, sharing. Yeah. How do we empower citizens, workers, and consumers to have power in these relationships? And how can unions ensure that workers have power in this new economy? And how can we, and this is what James talked about, how can we regulate effectively these new sectors in these new industries. You know, as progressives, we don't want to take another 100 years to get to ensure that the growth and the value from this industrial revolution is distributed. And we, there comes a tipping point when we say, we need to say, you know, it's not okay for nine-year-olds to be cleaning the, the carding machines of this industrial revolution. We need to be able to regulate and to ensure that it's shared. And if, as Larry was saying, you know, when the door to the future shuts, everything you know becomes worthless. We need to make sure we capture that tipping point, because if we don't, if we're on the wrong side of it or if we miss it, then, you know, and to mix my metaphors, 
we are going to be in deep viral shit for the next century. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Great. Well, I think our panelists alone have posed enough questions <laughs> that uh, we could take a while to answer them. Um, just to get things started, uh, I do have to go back to you, John, because you made an important statement. You were, you know, you heard it, early childhood education, child care, key priority, you're putting that up the flagpole. I think everyone in this room thought that was great news. What more can you tell them? Well, um, I was, I'm the child of a, my, my father died, he's an Irish immigrant, he died when I was a baby. I was raised by a single mother and I understand, I think firsthand, and I heard Andrea talking about this, Andrea Horvath, yesterday, that I think when you come from that perspective, you really appreciate now as a father, years later, the importance of making sure that everyone in a family is participating in the economy. And when we don't have affordable universal childcare, only one parent, if you have a two-parent family, can effectively and meaningfully participate in the economy. Childcare costs are absolutely out of control if you can find them in the Lower Mainland, and I believe that's the case certainly right across British Columbia and right across Canada. So I was very hopeful, obviously, in last October that uh, Tom Mulcair and his plan for a Canadian universal uh, affordable childcare plan would take hold, and I'm confident that over time that the incoming, the current federal government will recognize the importance of embracing ideas like that. But we need to make sure that there's a federal framework, but not be waiting for that. And, and I, I believe that I certainly I welcome federal participation. I will be looking for that the day after the election in May uh, 2017. But I'm not going to wait. And I don't think uh, families and children in British Columbia should have to wait for the country to get their act together. I think provinces can lead and, and invite the federal government to participate with us in that undertaking. That's great. So I couldn't help but notice uh, as I was browsing the internet today that there was uh, on The Economist website a, uh, a statement from uh, someone who's a close friend and colleague of Prof James Galbraith's, of James's, and someone who is providing some advice at the moment, it would appear, to uh, Cheese Party. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, in case you're wondering, of course, it's Yanis Varoufakis, the uh, former Syriza Minister of Finance in Greece. And what uh, Yanis Varoufakis was saying in his recommendation to the Labour Party was, you need to do what Harold Wilson did in the 1960s. And Harold Wilson, former Labour Prime Minister, my message to them is you have to do this, which is to recast the Labour Party as a political force behind renewal through investment in modern technologies. Back then it was the white heat of technology. Now it should be the cool breeze of sustainable technology. <laughs> now it's a little close to cool Britannia, admittedly. <laughs> but that being said, it seems to connect with some of the themes that you're getting at. Up, but, up. Absolutely. I mean, the, the cool breeze of sustainable, um, I, I, I don't know about the phrase, and it's interesting that he's going back to Wilson. I was going back to the Industrial Revolution. But I think the message is absolutely right. And I think we shouldn't be, if you like, you can look back to take the models, but we sh as I said, we've got to be about the future, right. and we've got to, the, the left can sometimes be, appear to um, crit criticize technology. To want, to, to want the status quo, even though the status quo is not in our interests, it's not in the interests of the, the, the people that we serve. We've got technology can, can, can reduce some of the, the numbers of jobs in some areas, but we should be making sure that it's creating new jobs and that our people, the people, the, you know, the people of our countries, have got the chance to, to t claim those jobs and that those jobs are well paid and they are well unionized and that they are well protected. And that means that is about looking forward and capturing the future because otherwise we are going to be, we are going to be seen as being a force of the past. And even though the battles we have won have been so important for so many, and I think Childcare is still a battle to be won in my country, but it is, a, it is so important. But we have got to have, if you like, the, the copyright on, on the future. And I think that's what Yanis is saying. 
any comment on, on your colleagues' uh, perspective? Yeah, let me just uh, say a word about this business of, of, of creating the jobs of the future. Uh, it, it seems to me that the first task one has is to work out what it is that we as a community most need to have done. Uh, and obviously, it, uh, this is going to vary from society to society. The priority to child care has been expressed here. Uh, and uh, there's a, certainly, as population ages, you need people who are uh, engaged in elder care. You need people who are engaged in higher education. You need people who are engaged in the, in the, in the crucial work of bringing about climate sustainability, which is a whole spectrum of of, of technical and engineering tasks and social design and reconstruction of the way in which we live, all of that has to be thought through and institutions have to be created that can provide precisely the stable and well-paid jobs uh, that, uh, that can enable these functions to be met. In many cases, what we need to recognize is that the private for-profit sector isn't going to do it. Uh, what you have to have is a public sector or a nonprofit sector. I like the, uh, in particular, mixing these things because with decentralization uh, and a diversity of funding sources, you can build up a political constituency for achieving these socially necessary and, and constructive functions. And then you have some chance of visualizing and realizing uh, a more humane, more sustainable uh, and more satisfactory uh, uh, mm. community life. Can I just? Add, I think I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think if you take an example of the, the you know, the sharing economy, the new intermediaries economy, hope you're like that. The, the Uber driver still needs. It, it's not that they don't need the support and protection of a union. They do. You know, they are more vulnerable. Uh, mm. They, the power relationship between an Uber driver and Uber, let me tell you, you know who's in, in whose favor that is. And so it's about the institutions, unions, the public sector being able to access and support them in new ways using some of the technology you know, that, that, that we have. And it's just really critically important that we, can, that we can do that, that we can ensure that the gains of the past are carried forward into the new forms of working. John, you were talking about the economy, the, the, how the economy in BC is not entirely what most of us assume. Yeah. And there's a piece of that that has a lot to do with technology. Yeah, we have uh, the high tech sector in the lower mainland right beside Washington State, which uh, James would know is uh, you know, a, a, a magnet uh, for high tech, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, and on and on, and then down to the uh, Silicon Valley. But in order to recruit and retain workers uh, in the high-tech sector, you have to have an affordable place to be. And if yeah. you can buy a house in Redmond, Washington, three times the size of the one you can buy in Vancouver for a fraction of the cost, it's really difficult to retain Canadian-trained workers from UBC to stay in Vancouver when they can drive just across the border oh. to work in Washington State and still get to Whistler at about the same time to go skiing. <laughs> so the, the advantages that British Columbia used to have in terms of our beauty and our bounty uh, is, is not enough to get you through in a modern economy. You have to also be able to provide uh, adequate seniors care. You have to be able to ensure that, that young families know that they can afford a home and they're going to be able to raise their families close to where they work. And so all of these variables, and, and Andrea Reimer was here yesterday on a panel, a city councillor in, in the city of Vancouver, and, and the Vision Vancouver Council led by Gregor Robertson, uh, Jeff Meggs was on the, uh, the infrastructure piece. The city of Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, is working very, very hard to address these issues, but they don't have a partner, and they haven't until recently had a partner at the federal level, and they have absolutely obstruction at the provincial level. So if we're going to manage affordability from the public sector perspective and, and, and enter the new economy with partnerships, with, with uh, not-for-profits, private sector, and public sector, you need to have willing partners, and you can't be combative in our multi-level federal system. You need to be cooperative, and I'm hopeful that we're on the verge of that in British Columbia. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're moving to questions from the audience, so a reminder, put up your hands. There's uh, volunteers in the audience with mics. I can barely see anything, so I'll <laughs> take my glasses off. Yeah, okay. So there's... 
volunteer. I see one there. Okay, there's someone over here with a question. And in the front. And then. Mm -hmm. We'll keep looking. And try and keep your questions brief. I was told to say, and you might have heard this in another session, the length of a tweet, which is a real challenge. So whoever, <laughs> you know, go for it. A tweet. So I wondered if you could talk about the importance of strong civil society movements uh, in terms of keeping the uh, issue of income inequality alive, especially from the most vulnerable. And we're talking persons with disabilities who often are silenced and are often unable to be a part of that discussion because of uh, the lack of funding to groups. Or you have government saying, well, we'll just cut your funding off and uh, the these groups die. So I thought one you could discuss the importance of civil society and their role at the table in influencing the discussion. Okay, who wants to take first stab at that? Yes. <laughs> they probably all want to say something. But so, something quick from each of you. Go for it. I say yes. Jeez. I mean, there's a, there, obviously it's important to have the social movement behind this going mm -hmm. ahead. Um, yeah, my, for me, the, the Labour, I'm the Labour Party, it's a Labour movement, and as part of that, it needs to have civil, civil society is, it, at its heart, and that can reach and engage and bring, it because we need, we need those voices. The, the Labour movement fails when it only becomes one voice or one demographic, so yeah, we need those voices. And I would just add uh, as well to the other panelists, the diversity in our communities needs to be reflected in, in the, the parties and the, and the governments that we form. Michelle Landsberg said yesterday, <laughs> Michelle Landsberg said yesterday, it's not good enough to be outside the building yelling at it. You have to be in the cabinet rooms affecting the change. And when you get into that room, you have to reflect the diversity of the community that you're, you're, you're supposedly governing for. Great. We have a question over here. Basic minimum income. wage, basic but at all another option could be the notion of basic income. I think that with basic income, you'd end up having a society we'll start with guaranteed enormously. annual income. That's what Let's say everybody was paid seventeen thousand dollars a year, and in exchange for that, they got to live and not worry about being in poverty. Just and they could also then be spending their time contributing to society, helping other people earning a wage on top of that, and living the kinds of lives, meaningful lives that they would like to dream. From an economist and cultural perspective, both, how realistic is that? Okay, so maybe we'll I, start I, with I, the economist. I, I, there was a big echo, so I, I basic annual, Basic income, guaranteed, guaranteed annual, annual income. income. Well, I think each, each country needs to work out what it should do in accord with its own circumstances. Uh, in the context of the United States, my own view is that the most important thing is to build on the social security system that we already have, because this is a very functional model. Uh, and it provides a specific period of uh, uh, essentially guaranteed income based on a formula related to your past earnings so that you have a kind of clear-cut division between working and retirement, which I rather think is a model with which the citizens of the US are familiar uh, and which they support. And so my own view on this is that one should build on the existing institutions, expand them, and gradually make them uh, you know, more universal and more effective than they are. Uh, very much, uh, I'm, I'm very much an incrementalist in that respect. Defend the things that work and 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 build on them. Yeah, I, I would echo I would echo James's point, but in the British Columbia context, as I said, there's been a decade of no increases on those basic incomes that are in place. Our system in BC has been flat and stagnant, along with real wage growth as well. So that speaks to the working poor, and then those who, who do depend on assistance have not been seeing an increase, nor have we seen it with respect to a basic minimum wage. So I, I believe that we, we should defend what we have, we should stimulate where we can, and then over time as the national di dialogue begins to take hold, and we're all hopeful that that new era is now upon us in Canada, 
and hopefully very shortly in British Columbia, and certainly well entrenched in Alberta right now. Uh, I, I think the opportunity to, to follow that is, is going to be there. But today, we, we're, in, we're in a defensive position rather than an offensive position. If I could just tell a little story, since you heard from Gloria Steinem yesterday morning. Uh, I was on the floor of the Democratic National Convention along with Gloria in uh, 1972 when, they, when, when the McGovern's oh, yeah. $1,000 a year plan was, uh, was, was, was on the agenda. On the agenda. Uh, perhaps I've become a little cautious about that proposal given the, given the consequences in that particular yeah, electoral yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. not a success. Um, <laughs> The only thing I would add to that is that one of, in, the, in the UK, one of the most despicable sort of vi vistas that we've had before us is the deliberate targeting of those on welfare on the basis that they're not going to vote for the Conservatives and that by demonizing them, by saying that they're work shy, lazy, stay a bed, which is basically what they've been saying, you know, that that can, um, that can create an enemy for the working poor to look down upon. And it's been, and, and it, is, it has been really um, aggressive and unsettling. And universal income um, prevents that by the nature of its universality. So what I would say is I think, I think it's something that we are looking at, that we need to look at. I reckon I think there are real issues with it, and I'm inclined to go also for the incremental approach. But we need to do something which, which ensures that um, those on welfare are not demonized and stigmatized, not simply by progressive governments, but by non-progressive governments ever in the future. You know? so, Unfortunately, we've, it seems we've run out of time, um, but I can say that these folks, I think, can promise to meet you just outside here and answer any questions you might have. Uh, really amazing panel. Thank you, James Galbraith, Shion Wura, John Horgan. Thank you to the Progress Center.